Madagascar lies in the Indian Ocean about 220 miles off the east coast of Africa, well south of the equator, which you can see here, but it does lie in the um, tropic zone. So it is tropical in nature. Um, Capricorn goes through the very lower half, so that would be the end of the tropics down at the, the very bottom, actually it's shown on this, this map right here. So there's the, oops, Tropic of Capricorn, and I wanna go back. So we, you fly in, um, Madagascar was uh, owned by or run by the French for a long time, and so Air France has daily flights into Antananarivo, that's about the only time I'm ever gonna be able to pronounce any Madagascar name because they are unpronounceable. So Antananarivo is just known as Tana for short. Madagascar is known as Mada for short. So you fly in from Paris to, um, to Tana and then the birding spots around Tana are on this uh, edge of this escarpment down into the very wet Eastern coast of, of of Mata, and you spend several days there. We then flew from Tana up to the uh, northwest to um, bird this area for a while, which is a totally different habitat, and then back to Tana. And then we drove from Tana down this main highway all the way down to the southwest coast, which is a completely different habitat than all the others. So we pretty much covered all the, um, the habitats that are available in Madagascar, searching of course for birds. Uh, Madagascar has a, the East Coast, which is extremely wet. The, the trade winds come in from the uh, East. And so this swath of land here on the Madagascar East Coast will get somewhere like 150 inches of rain a year, the most in this Masiola Peninsula, which we did not go to because it's difficult to get there, you have to fly and the flights are unreliable. So you have rainfall here where you have tropical rainforest, you have deciduous forest, remnants of both, and remnants of, of uh, evergreen forest along the swath with completely different animals, plants, and birds that are living in that area. Most of the people are living in the central plateau of Madagascar, which is about 2,000 feet or so high, going up to, I think, 4,000 feet. Um, it's totally degraded habitat. Uh, there are 28 million people living in Madagascar, and uh, it's mostly subsistence living. Um, a lot of rice farms, which you will see. And then the very west coast is extremely dry because there's a rain shadow effect from this escarpment on the east. And uh, well, the central plateau will get something like 60 inches of, e of year, mostly in the rainy season, which is comparable to what we get here in New Orleans. And then the west coast gets even less rain because of the rain shadow effect. And you'll get maybe 14 or 15 or 16 inches of rain in this northwestern part. And the driest part of the country is down here where they get six inches of rain annually. And it's mostly a thorn uh, scrub land and, and, and desert. Um, as I mentioned, Ken set up this trip with his good friend. This is Errol De Beer, who was a South African. Um, if you ask him, he is very distantly related to the De Beer diamond people and too distant for him to <laughs> claim anything, sadly enough. So he leads bird, he leads birding trips. He, he's um, well known throughout Africa. So if you ever want to go birding in Africa, uh, contact Errol and he can uh, either take you himself or set you up with um, his long list of guides. And he got, does guide in Madagascar. So he was the one that arranged the trip for us. And our local guide was Julian, who was with us the whole time, a really delightful guy. And as his local guides are, fantastic vision. Uh, so you can see anything moving anywhere within what, a mile or something <laughs> of where you are. And uh, without even binoculars, he can find it and he will get you um, on, the, um, on the bird. Nadrema was our guide only for the north western part of the trip and you can see some body language between Julian and Nadrema. These guys did not uh, <laughs> like each other very much. Julian felt like Nadrema was stepping on his territory. And Luba was our, our bus driver who uh, drove us all over the place down that long road down to the, to, the, to the southwest. And even though we flew into the northwestern part of the country, Luba had to drive the truck 
uh, the van to, uh, to greet us and uh, just a horrendous, horrendous drive, I think, for him. Lodging in Madagascar is quite nice. This is, this is a place that we stayed right in Tana and uh, a lot of good birds right in the, uh, in the lodge area itself. Um, again, another view of that same lodge that, that's, that's in Tana. You don't have to worry about um, when you go to Madagascar about where you're going to stay. This is, this is on the um, eastern slopes and even though it's totally deforested, um, it had access to all the, the national parks that are on that east coast, which are full of lemurs and, and birds. One thing to notice in this photograph, this is a lodge that uh, is attracting um, nature-oriented tourists. And what do you see growing around the lodge? But um, hmm, uh, non-native plants. Uh, the forest has been cut down and they're replacing the forest now with uh, eucalyptus. So there are two species of eucalyptus in this photograph, which is really sad because um, there's a lot of eucalyptus being um, planted in Madagascar. Another lodge was that, that was just in a little town on our drive down to the southwest. It was a little French um, hotel, very delightful. One of the most beautiful places was in the northeast, which was right on the um, the, uh, on, the coast. on the coast. Yes, this is Caribou Lodge and beautifully landscaped and overlooking the, um, the, the water. The uh, dining area was here. So you had like an outdoor dining experience. You could swim, of course, none of us swam in the pool, but that's all right. And then on the Southeast coast, the Southwest coast, I'm sorry, uh, the same sort of thing. This was Ken's and my personal room. So everybody had their own little chalet. And in front of our chalet were our own little private beach chairs looking out over the beach and looking out over the, uh, not quite Indian Ocean, but the Straits of, Straits of yeah, Mozambique. Yes. This was one of the most spectacular lodges because it reminded me of Utah. It was built right into these um, sandstone um, rock cliffs. It's called the Asalo Rock Lodge. And the rock cliffs were just, I mean, the, the rocks themselves were just uh, gorgeous and, and fun to look at. And of course, there were some good birds around too. Another uh, typical Madagascar name that um, is a national park in, in the, in the northwest, uh, which uh, who can pronounce, maybe Joe, my friend Joe down can pronounce that because he's been to Madagascar. Conan Errol, this was our, um, our lowest level lodge. And frankly, it wasn't all that bad. Uh, these were our individual little cabins, but you can see how dry. Mm -hmm. um, food was a bit... Uh, uh, well, Ken says the plain. food was a little plain, but... Well, uh, it was perfectly comfortable. So the different habitats that we're burning in would be sort of a tropical uh, rainforest from the um, east, a dry forest. The central plateau, this is what the central plateau looks like. Every, uh, every bit of wetland has been turned into um, rice fields, more rice fields. And then birding trails, you would go through the forest on these well manicured uh, trails looking for birds. A lot of the birds in Madagascar are ground dwelling birds, which is quite interesting. And then in the southwest where it's extremely dry, you have all these uh, uh, desert loving plants, I guess, and um, thorny forest. The, so the spiny forest is the typical um, habitat and Errol is telling you, <laughs> do not touch. But another view of the, of the dry spiny forest. This was actually, for me, I think one of the most exciting areas in Madagascar as far as not just the birds, but also the other critters that are, that are living there. Baobab, baobab trees occur on Madagascar, and as a matter of fact, in Mata, there are seven species of baobab. There's one species of baobab in Africa, and there's one species of baobab in Australia. So um, evolution, evolution has taken over on Madagascar and has um, taken the, the baobabs into to seven distinct species. Some more baobabs. Uh, looking in the foreground, we see... Um, prickly pear cactus. You know, prickly pear cactus doesn't live in the um, old world. So again, we have some invading species that are there moving in and, and taking over. Why they were brought there, I do not know. So we'd also bird along the road. This is um, 
Joan and Tom, and the cattle on Madagascar are called zebu, and zebu is their beast of burden, uh, used for everything from the um, dinner table at breakfast time to um, providing milk, meat, uh, and also as a beast of burden. Uh, we also used zebu carts to get out to boats when the uh, tide was out and it was too shallow for the boat to come in. We went out to the boat in um, a zebu cart, which was um, kind of a lot of fun. And then uh, some of the little islands offshore Madagascar we visited by boat. And here's Ken and um, Errol walking down the beach. Beautiful, beautiful scenery. The central highlands as you go south become drier and drier in sort of a, a grassland sort of habitat. And this is the main road that cuts, goes down from Tana to the, um, the southwest and it just goes on and on and on and on. And here is the, uh, the sandstone uh, cliffs of the lodge where we had stayed. And this is a very famous road, so we had to take a, a, a picture of this sign in seven. And you would stop in Burr, there'd be these little villages along, along the uh, roadside. In flying from Tana to the northwest, you fly over territory that looks like this, which is just desolate. Um, they say that 80% of the forest is gone on Madagascar, and some accounts say that Madagascar may have been totally forested before man entered the scene. So, um, as you can see, this is totally deforested, uh, just a total wasteland. And then you have just uh, sand along the coast at some places. And why these poor people are crossing the sand, who knows. There's still some French colonial architecture around, not an awful lot, but some. And um, there are some fairly decent houses. This is in Tana, and um, this is this is a um, a lake preserve that uh, is in private hands. I think that you can go into. And in this lake preserve in the town of of Tana, there are two endangered endemic species, uh, both of which we did see here which is amazing. But housing goes from fairly nice, like what you saw there, to this typical scene in town. Again, this is in Tana, of people living right next to their, their rice paddies and um, houses that maybe are not so nice, to nice little brick structures, to yeah. you know, kind of typical in the, in the Southwest where it's getting drier, you get um, just kind of sticking in mud houses. Oops. And again, you can see how dry the landscape is getting. This was taken out of a moving bus, but uh, I find it interesting. This probably is their house, but look at look at the uh, the skin and bone on these these people's legs. There's not just not much around. Although this is a, this is a mountain pass where you can see there are some women, some barefoot, some wearing shoes, but very you know nicely dressed. I wish I had seen this piece of cloth somewhere because I would have bought it. It does say mad on the bottom and here is a, a lemur on her rear end. There was a lemur on her front side too. And people of all sorts, some walking down the road, um, barefoot, not real clean. That's very strange lady. <laughs> so there's no free education in Mata. So the children do not go to school except for those that can afford to go to private schools. So children are working um, fairly long, young along with their parents. And um, as, as all over the world, people are worried about um, how beautiful they are and how beautiful they look. So this is a beauty treatment. And I wish I had bought some of this stuff to bring it home because we could have bought it in one, a couple of the lodges, but they leave it on all day long. So I don't know if the beauty treatment is the beautiful thing or if your skin is beautiful when you take the beauty treatment off. But this was in the Northwest. Yeah. And of course, clothes are washed in um, dirty water. Dried by just laying them out on the bank. And the, the towns that you go through have a lot of people, especially on market days. And um, the people actually are a mix of African and Indonesian. 
So Madagascar has a strange history where they think the first people that came into Madagascar were from Indonesia and uh, later from, from Africa. So it's an Indonesian African mix. There are something like 28 tribes of people and the predominant religion is still the native religion. Christianity is second at maybe 40 some percent, but over 50% still practice their native religion. Um, markets, there seems to be a lot of food in the markets and the food looks quite nice. Um, looking at this, this beautiful lettuce, cauliflower, some kind of beans. Don't know what that fruit is, but uh, a sweet potato is another one of their crops down in that basket. And because of the, the French, uh, I think the French only left in like 1960, um, there's French bread. So French bread is, um, can be found all over the country as it can in South Vietnam. These poor critters, I think we're not gonna have a, a happy ending. And uh, meat markets, and this is all zebu meat, were on the sides of the roads. And so collecting dust and, and flies uh, from the main highway, they went right through the uh, center of town. Fish seem to collect the most flies. You can see the flies on this lady and there's some flies on the, on the fish. Luckily we we're in the bus so we couldn't smell the fish. Transportation can be by bicycle rickshaw, can be by human powered uh, carts, bicycles, zebu carts, more zebu carts, so these people are collecting firewood. They still um, cook with, uh, a large proportion cook with, with wood, and these are the eucalyptus trees, and they, they're actually harvesting eucalyptus trees for, although this looks almost like a uh, pine. And as I said, there are, are numerous different tribes of Madagascar people, and this was one group that were uh, parading down the road as we drove through on, in our vehicle, not knowing what was going on. And it turned out to be uh, a funeral. So here is the casket. But everybody is happy because what they do is when a person dies in this particular group, uh, they get buried, but not at their, their final resting place. They get buried. And then I think after seven years or something, they dig them up. And then there's a big celebra a joyous celebration. It's our second line. So they're actually doing a New Orleans second line and they're taking this person to its final resting place. And um, one area, the uh, ahead before you die, when you're still young and, and have a lot of money, maybe or something, you build your own tomb. And they had these fancy little tombs on the side of the road waiting for the person to die so they could be brought there seven years after their death. This is another funeral. I was told not to take a photograph of the funeral, but it was like, oops, too late. And um, here's somebody going off uh, in the middle of nowhere. There, nothing around here. This was a, a marshy area. And here the funeral possession with lots of people making lots of noise going, um, going right by. People, what people do for a living there is um, in some areas where there's clay, they'll dig the clay and they'll make uh, bricks why they arrange these bricks in these lovely uh, configurations, don't know, but it's just on the side of the road, you pass all these brickworks. When the clay has uh, run out, uh, they turn the, um, the ground into um, rice patties. Everything done by hand, of course, no uh, mechanized machinery at all. Zebu being used to um, flatten the field for planting. And this was a, a, a farm with uh, beautiful uh, green onions being tended by the ladies. And in the Southwest, and we asked about going even further South and they said, well, you really can't go there because it's like the wild west. There's still cattle rustling going on and um, they have uh, gem mines. So these people are actually mining for sapphires. And um, the story is that if like this guy who's got his little pan going there, if he would find a sapphire, there'd be no expression, there'd be no nothing. He would kind of try to hide it in his pocket. 
so no one sees it because if everybody knew he had found a sapphire, he probably would be killed on his way home. Um, one of the members of our group wanted to buy sapphires and we were going through towns that had jewelry stores shops for um, for stones and the bus never would stop. And he said, well, you know, why aren't you stopping? And they said, well, you know, the bus driver at Luba says it's too dangerous in this town to even stop and get out. So we kept on going until uh, we got to the coast where it was probably a little bit safer to, um, to shop. Fishing is also a very important thing on the coast. And you hear about um, Indonesian ferries that, that sink all the time. Well, here's a ferry on Mata that's loaded with people top and bottom. And hopefully they made it to their destination. These people, for some reason, I believe, are wearing life jackets, which means they had a little bit more sense. Fishing boats are very primitive, but yet very beautiful. So why Madagascar? Why, why, why would you want to go there? And if, if you're a birder, and by the way, I, um, I, I screenshot this with my cell phone off of a um, um, rock jumper birding tours webinar that they had recently to Madagascar. And I was so impressed. I thought I would steal some of their stuff. So there are 310 species of birds in Madagascar, according to the um, IOC taxonomy. And uh, Ken and I followed the Clements taxonomy, which is uh, a US-based thing where they show 30, 309 species. Both of them have 108 endemics. I don't know what the two breeding endemics mean, but anyway, Joe could tell me that. And uh, 38 globally threatened species. eBird, on the other hand, has one less species of, of, of birds, but uh, let's disregard eBird. The important bird families that are in Madagascar, again, you can see a little bit of the rock jumper down here at the bottom. Thank you, rock jumper. Um, cuckoo rollers, where there is one species, the mesites, which is an endemic family of, of birds. Madagascar has four endemic families of birds, and it shares two families with um, another island very close to Madagascar. So really almost six endemic families of birds. Three species of mesites. Um, the acetes, four species, ground rollers, another endemic family, five, seven owls. Oops, Mad Mad Malagasy warblers have just been split off into a family of their own. So it's an endemic family found uh, on Mata. There are 11 species, 16 species of raptors. Bangas, 21 species of Bangas. Bangas was um, at one time the big endemic family of Madagascar. Now a couple of species have been found on the, the Comores, which are just to the north. And I think just recently a um, uh, species of birds that's found um, in Africa um, has been moved into the Vanga group. In addition to the birds, the mammals in Madagascar are just um, phenomenal, phenomenal. So there are 241 species. Um, all 148 native terrestrial species are endemic. And there are five major mammal groups in Madagascar, the bats, the tenrex, uh, rice and, rats and mice, of course, and uh, a, a herpestine-like carnivore, uh, and the primates, which are all lemurs. What's important about Madagascar is not only what's there, but what's not there. So there are no cats, big cats on Madagascar. There are, are no big grazers on Madagascar. So there, there, there are no antelope um, or giraffes or that sort of thing. You know, they're so close to Africa, you'd think they would have gotten some of that. They broke off from Africa long before those animals had evolved. So, and um, because there aren't any big carnivores, there are a lot of ground dwelling birds and mammals. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna run through the bird species that we saw, and I try to do this in kind of a taxonomic order, who knows. But um, uh, the first we come to are the ducks. And so this is Meller's duck, which is an endemic duck. And this was found in that little lake area in Tana that we saw. Uh, another duck that's endemic is the Bernier's teal, which is found on the uh, west coast, along with the Madagascar sacred ibis, which is not endemic because they can fly to other, other islands. Lesser flamingos, which are found all over Africa and all over a whole bunch of other places, so not endemic, but again on that, that uh, west coast. 
and a flying lesser flamingo with two Bernier's teals in, in the background. This is a bird that Ken and I neither have seen in our travels and we're very excited to see. It's not endemic, it's found in a lot of places in the world, but it's a crab plover. So um, this was one of our life birds, not an endemic species. And he, who even knew there were endemic herons uh, on Madagascar? But here's the humblot heron, which is this bird back here, and the gray heron, which is again found all over Africa and, and Asia. Uh, a pleasant bird to see was the red-tailed tropic bird, which was nesting on one of those um, islands that we took a boat trip, and you can just barely make out uh, the red tail of the tropic bird, but I think in this photograph you can see that indeed it is a um, red-tailed tropic bird. And then there are things that happen along the way that are totally unexpected. This is Andre. Andre is the fellow that runs or owns the uh, tour company on Madagascar. Uh, the ground agent that Arrow uses to set the tour up. And Andrew, for some reason, was with us most of the trip, except when he had to take a bus back to Tana for a wedding. And here's Luba in the front seat. But we had been dropped off on the side of the road to do some birding in this, this grassland. And all of a sudden, Andrew starts yelling and screaming because running right in front of him were these two Madagascar partridges. I mean, how, how wonderful is that? And we went running, literally running down the road to try and get close enough to, to see him. And um, so kind of a closer view of, of male and female uh, endemic Madagas Madagascar partridge, delightful bird. This was the um, other threatened endemic species that's found in that lake area in Tana. This is a Malagasy pond heron, pink legs, blue bill, striated heron, which looks just like our green heron in um, the US. Striated heron is also found in South America. Now you say, gee, that's a lousy shot. Why is she showing that photograph? But anyway, whoever knew, I didn't know, I don't know if Ken knew, of an ibis that lived in the forest, um, a wet forest, and uh, lives close to streams. But this is a real skulking ibis. And you can see the bill here and the bird back here is mostly in focus. And the way we got to see this bird it took us two attempts to find it, but um, the guide would get kids from the neighborhood to go out and beat the birds to us. So they would run through the forest, find the bird, and then get behind the bird and kind of chase it to us so we could, we could see this bird. So this was a real good bird to, to see. Looking at raptors, there are a whole bunch of endemic raptors. Um, on Madagascar, the, the cuckoo hawk. This was in the uh, dry southwest yellow-billed kite, which is non-endemic. Uh, Madagascar fish eagle, looks like every other fish eagle, looks like a bald eagle, white head, white tail, living on water, living close to where they get fish. Madagascar harrier hawk, who was having something to do with this little Madagascar buzzer down here. They seemed like they were palling around, but that seemed rather strange. Here's a Madagascar buzzer. Saw his little head in the last photo. Madagascar sparrowhawk. So Madagascar has spent millions of years isolated from um, any other landmass, and so this amount of endemism is, is extremely high. Madagascar kestrel, which flies off to other islands, so it's not endemic. This was a great find. This is another bird we had to run for. We, we, we were hollered at to, to get down here quick because there was a banded kestrel. As you see, it's in the spiny, it's in the, in the spiny forest. So our first endemic family would be the uh, mesites. There are three species of mesites. We saw three. I think I only have photographs of two or maybe even one. This is Ken's photograph of a brown knee site. Again, a, a forest dwelling bird that uh, the guys went out and herded in our direction. You just have to stand there and the bird winds up, you know, five feet from you, which is quite nice. This is a sub-desert knee site, a completely different looking bird than this one. I mean, look at the bill on this and look at the bill on this one, long and curved. Um, living in the desert where the other one is living in a wet forest. Madagascar 
button quail. Button quail are usually extremely difficult to find, and uh, this bird was fairly easy to find, but you can see how cryptic it is and how it blends into the uh, surrounding leaf litter. White-throated crake is a near endemic, so it's found on some of the other um, islands around um, Madagascar. Three banded plover. Pretty little bird with its red eye ring. Madagascar plover, which is a fun bird to find because you had to traipse over this uh, little grass field, um, looking for it and chasing it down. A turtle dove. Can't see the head, too bad, but um, nice back, endemic. One of my favorite doves, this is found widely in Africa, the Namakwa dove, pretty attractive. Ken's photograph of the uh, Madagascar green pigeon. Green pigeons are found throughout uh, Asia, Africa. Madagascar blue pigeon, big bird. Uh, Gray-headed lovebirds, endemic. Guess where they live? Thorn forest. A parrot that isn't very pretty. It's a brown parrot, so uh, called the greater bossa parrot. There's also a lesser bossa parrot, which looks almost the same. I think the head shape or head size is a little different. But anyway, it's a life bird. So the uh, kuas of Madagascar are endemic. It's an endemic subfamily to Madagascar. It's a fairly large subfamily. This is the green cap kua. Yep, doesn't look green cap to me either. The crested kua, very attracting. And you can see a bit of its crest up here, but if you want a better picture of the crest, <laughs> it's in this photo. Nice little peachy uh, bit on the breast, purple around the eye, and a nice bushy hairdo. Red cap kua, and he does have a red cap. Uh, I'm going to admit somebody from the waiting room because I think that was Barbara. This is the giant kua, a really big bird. And again, ground birds, so these were all herded to us. We didn't have to do much uh, work. A running kua, which did run for a long time and finally uh, it got treed. The blue kua. Uh, the Madagascar kukal. Kukals are found uh, all over Asia. They found in Africa too? Yeah, yeah. Yes. And some of the real nice owls that are there, endemic Malagasy scops owl. Well hidden and the guides are brilliant. <laughs> the Toro Toroka scops owl. Joe, or is it pronounced scopes owl? White browed owl, very well named. I vote Scops. You say Scops? Okay, good. I say Scops. By the way, can I brag about my friend Joe? My friend Joe has seen 9,000 birds in the world. Amazing. Uh, Madagascar nightjar, which was found on the roof of our lodge in Tana. This is the tile roof. We kind of stood on a pile of loose tiles. Collar nightjar, endemic and uh, very cryptic, very hard to see. And there are actually two birds here. Here's a bill of one, here's a bill of a second. Here's the eye of the second, here's the eye of the first. This is a wing bar and um, all the tails are back there. But uh, two endemic collared nightjars on their day roost. They'd be flying at night. Ken's photograph of the Malagasy kingfisher front and back. Uh, I love forest kingfishers because they're, uh, <laughs> their, their colors are so unique. So here's an endemic American Madagascar pygmy king, kingfisher, which is found in the forest, feeding mostly on insects, I think, Joe. Madagascar bee eater, another insect eater. Uh, endemic family, the ground rollers. So there are four species of ground rollers, three of which we saw. This is a horrible photograph, but it was very, very dark. Uh, Pitta-like ground roller, because to me, the coloration is just like a, uh, an Asian pitta. Everyone's favorite, the long tail ground roller. You'll see this, this bird on the, on the cover of bird list or bird books and so forth. Um, again, it was chased in by um, our little group of beaters that uh, ran through the, the forest and found them. 
Madagascar hoopoo, which is endemic, but it looks to me, it looks like every other hoopoo that's around African and hoopoo or Eurasian, Eurasian hoopoo. Uh, the, the acetes, four species, three seen. Schlegel's acidy, most of the acetes have this bare patch around the eye, which is, is colored. Unfortunately, you can't see anything in that photograph. This is Ken's wonderful photograph of the common sun, sunbird acidy. Look at, look at the bill on that uh, sunbird acidy. Just the, the amount of, of radiation that uh, these bird families have undergone on Madagascar to fill in niches that are occupied by other, other birds. Cuckoo roller, there's one um, cuckoo roller that we saw, and the cuckoo rollers are um, related to the broadbills of Asia. So the, the bird population in Asia has some African um, relatives and also uh, some Asian. The paradise flycatcher of Madagascar looks like almost every other paradise flycatcher that you find. That's the male, and this is the um, female. And a lark is a lark is a lark is a lark, no matter where you see him, who knows, but uh, I guess, you know, this goes as another tick on the uh, life list. So an endemic Madagascar lark. Tetraka, there, there are birds whose names we've never heard of before, long-billed Tetraka. The Malagasy warblers, which were just put into their own um, endemic family a few years ago. Uh, they look like all the other old world warblers, but they're evidently not related to them. So this was a sub-desert brush warbler. Madagascar bush, no, Madagascar brush warbler. And the Madagascar swamp warbler. Magpie robins are always fun and uh, fairly easy to photograph, especially this is a female. And the reason why it's easy to photograph is while you're having uh, breakfast, they are waiting on the rail for you to get up and leave so uh, they can come in and steal leftover eggs from the, um, from the plate. So here's the um, male magpie robin with its uh, egg meal in its mouth. They just fly back and forth. Rock thrushes, forest rock thrush, Benson's rock thrush. Literal rock thrush. I think we uh, maybe scooped up all three of the we rock did. thrushes, yeah. which was nice. Striped throated Jerry. Uh, Ken's photograph taken at night of common Jerry's that are um, were sleeping until all the lights got uh, uh, flashed on them for photography, but they're on their night roost. Another one of Ken's photographs of the Madagascar white eye. White eyes are found all over Asia. The sunbirds, which are kind of the, to me, the hummingbird counterpart in the old world, since there are no hummingbirds in the old world and there are no sunbirds in the new world. So this is the Suimanga sunbird, the Madagascar green sunbird, neither are endemic because they wander to um, other islands. And then the Vangas. The Vangas have been a family, the family of Vangaday, which has kind of made, I guess, Madagascar famous. And the evolutionary radiation that's found in the, in the Vangas is extraordinary, uh, filling all, again, all these different niches. So here's a Vanga that happen, happens to have the name of Newtonia. So a common Newtonia. Archibald's uh, Newtonia. Nuthatch Vanga. So this is a Vanga that take, takes on the niche of nuthatches. Um, and the only thing is that the nuthat Vanga can only go up a tree. It can't turn around and come back down a tree. So it just ascends and doesn't um, descend like our nuthatches go up and down. This is a Vanga. Look how different. So this is a sickle billed Vanga. Huge bill. Rufus Vanga. The Vangas go on and on and on and on and on. Van, Dam, Van Dam's Vanga. Big bills, little bills, little birds, big birds. Shabbat's Vanga. White-headed Vanga. Hook-billed Vanga looks like a shrike, right? Look at the hook on the end of the bill. Crosley's Vanga that's uh, on a nest. 
Red shouldered Vanga. I put on here Phoebe's last bird because um, it's kind of meant a lot to me. So I don't know if you know you know about Phoebe Schnetzinger, but is yeah, that showing? Yeah. Yep. <coughs> Phoebe Schnetzinger was the first woman <coughs> to see over eight thousand birds in the world. And she was um, diagnosed, I guess, in the 80s or something with terminal melanoma. <clears throat> and she was told she only had six months to live. And so she said, well, what am I gonna do with my time? And she said, I'm gonna go see as many birds as I can. And so she started <clears throat> birding big time on an international scale. And I think Joe was on a birding trip with Phoebe, were you not, Joe? A couple of times, actually, she was an incredible person to, to get to know. So um, Phoebe, Phoebe did become the first person to see uh, 8,000 birds. Her melanoma went into um, remission numerous times. <clears throat> I think she missed her mother's funeral because she had a birding trip. I think she missed her daughter's wedding because she had a birding trip. And this bird, the uh, red shoulder Vanga, was first described in the 1990s. And it was a bird that she had not seen. And so in 1999, Phoebe was on uh, her trip to Madagascar to see this bird and another bird. And in fact, she did see this bird and they had gotten up at 4.30 in the morning or something to go out and look at this bird. And, and um, they were moving on to another birding site and she decided she was going to um, lay down in the van and, and take a nap while they were driving and the, uh, van turned over and she was the only one killed in the van and uh, a couple of the other people were hurt but like a broken arm or something but she was the only one that was killed so um she was writing this book birding on birding on borrowed time borrowed time because of the, the melanoma <clears throat> and her son actually finished the book for her and it's it's a great book um, if you really like international birding, but even without international birding, this is a book about Phoebe's life called Life List, um, written by, by someone else, which is uh, equally um, as fun to read. So if you haven't read The Life of Phoebe Schnetzinger, please do. And um, after we saw this bird, we were driving back to our lodge <clears throat> and Errol said, this is the place where Phoebe died on the road. And it, it was really moving because I had pictured her death spot from reading the book and it wasn't anything what uh, Errol had showed us. It was like nothing on the road, but they said it was raining and, and the road was slippery and the van slid off. And there was just like a little ditch on the side that it rolled into and, and killed her. But anyway, this was Phoebe's last bird, the uh, red-shouldered vanga. Drongos, which are found throughout Asia. And Africa, this is an endemic drongo, the crested drongo, another endemic wagtail, weavers, <laughs> Madagascar munia. This brings us to the mammals. So um, most of the people who tra travel to Madagascar do so because of the uh, lemurs and they are really, really incredible. So the Endry, give me a second here and I'll try and do something fancy. So the Endry is the largest prosimian. Um, lemurs are not monkeys, but they are prosimians. And this is the Endry calling. So you can imagine birding in the wet forest, and these are found on the eastern slope. You can imagine birding in, on the wet forest and just hearing these, these bands of injury, these troops of, of injury calling back and forth to one another. It's so, it's so reminiscent of the uh, <clears throat> um, howler monkeys in, in Central America. So there, there are no monkeys in Madagascar. They're, they're uh, um, nothing higher than the uh, prosimians. Uh, another lemur, the, the golden bamboo lemur. These are fairly easy to see. They're kind of habituated. red belly lemur eating uh, bamboo. Ringtail lemur. Um, 
the ringtail lemur is found on the drive down to the southwest. And there, there are villages along the road that actually protect the habitat for um, some of these species, especially this ringtail lemur. And then they have like a little reserve and then you pay them to go into the reserve and then you hire one of their people to uh, take you in there. And so they found out that by preserving these animals that they can actually make money on the side. Now, for the last year, when there's been no visitors, yeah. um, you can imagine that perhaps maybe they're eating the lemurs again because they do they they have eaten lemurs, and they have no income coming in. So uh, you know it's just a horrible thought to what's happening to to some of these things and to the the people of Madagascar. So this little lemur preserve, the little ringtail lemur preserve. Um, the, the ringtail lemurs are, are ground dwelling lemurs and in the heat of the day we were there kind of around noon a little after the, they take a little siesta up in the trees and so here's a little group of lemurs taking a, a, a rest up in the, in the trees little baby sticking its tongue out uh, sapacas are also lemurs so this is a diadem sapaca <clears throat> uh, varro sapaca this is my favorite lemur photograph Another Varose, Kokoro Safaka. Lemurs can be very, very tiny. So these sporty lemurs are very tiny um, and they, they're, they're found sleeping in the daytime in um, holes and trees. And they have a way of staring with their, their eyes. One of the exciting things also are night walks. So if you go to Madagascar, make sure you do um, night walks. And this is up in the mountains on, on, the, on the East Coast, so in the uh, forest. And you just walk out from your lodge down the, the road that you had driven up. And these are all other people at the lodge that have their headlamps on and looking for things. So at night, you can find some um, other lemurs who are sleeping when you woke them up. And this poor little guy was surrounded by thousands of people. Not that. Not thousands, it's probably 20 people. Goodman's mouse lemur, gray brown mouse lemur, little tiny things. <clears throat> uh, two thirds of all chameleons are found in uh, Madagascar. And again, on these night walks, uh, they'll spot these sleeping chameleons. You can see how small they are because they're sleeping on the end of a leaf or on a stick. The elephant ear, this is a bigger chameleon that's maybe five or six inches long. Ustalets, which is pretty big. O'Shaughnessy's. They are really quite beautiful, but can you imagine having a good night's sleep like this? Like that? And they're also, uh, one thing that the, the chameleons are, they're being caught up in the um, trafficking trade um, of being sent to other countries and it's really decimating their population along with habitat loss. This is a, uh, this little kid's pet of his. He's cute. No school for him. <clears throat> Warty chameleon, short-nosed, elephant-eared. I don't know what he is, but I just like the photograph. You know, chameleons have those eyes that work um, uh, independent of each other and circle around and go all different directions. Uh, the Madagascar um, colored iguana. Now, I always thought that the Geico gecko was from Australia because he seemed to have an Australia accent. But I do believe that this is the Geico gecko and he's from Madagascar. Where his voice came from, <clears throat> I think is a, a um, what, a, <laughs> an error on the way of the producer of the, of the Geico commercial. Another gecko. So this is on that lodge, the wall of the lodge right next to our table, where we were eating that lodge in the Northwest that, um, Errol had said was, you know, the, the poorest one we were going to be in. Life goes on. And this was brutal. I mean, this guy was brutal to this other thing. He was, he has her by the leg 
and he dragged her up the wall and she was trying to get away and I almost wanted to intervene. I didn't realize what was going on. And then after a while that was going on. So I said, oh, never mind. But he was being brutal. Three-eyed lizard, you can see the third eye right here on the, the top of the head. I think it is a light sensor, but it certainly doesn't act as an eye. And there are um, big tortoises. This was in a compound. Snakes, there are uh, tree boas that I think are endemic and some other kind of uh, grass snakes that were quite funny. I think they were outside where the ringtail lemurs were and they would all come out of the hole and they would like scurry around everybody's feet and so forth and all of a sudden they'd all go back in the hole together and then you'd see the little heads poking out again, back and forth, back and forth. And on those night walks, you also saw a bunch of the, um, the frogs. So Madagascar bright-eyed frog, green. This is an undescri undes undescribed frog that was found in the wet forest by an older gentleman that guided us. And uh, he was telling us about it. And we said, well, can we see it? So he sent his, his you know. little <laughs> kids off and they came back with this undescribed uh, uh, frog. It's pretty amazing. Oh, you men, I swear, here you, you are riding on the back of the poor female who has to haul you all over the place. <laughs> Insects are incredible. So um, I know this is uh, an out of focus shot, but I've never been able to photograph flying butterflies. These look like birds. They're, they're huge. And, and they, in the corner of your eye, you'd think you'd have a bird and you'd take your binoculars out. Oh, it's just another butterfly. So anyway, I got a photograph of this red-bodied uh, swallowtail. This flatted leaf bug decorates itself like this as a, uh, a ward against uh, predators. So if a predator tries to bite him, it gets a mouth of this stuff that just breaks right off. My favorite of all insects is this giraffe neck weevil. He's on the underside of a leaf, so he's upside down, but look at his neck. Here's his head and his antennae. What an incredible uh, species of, of insect. And then the regular damselfly, Jill might know what they are. So as, as we're going along this trip, Ken kept asking Errol, where's a ten wreck? I wanna see a ten wreck. And they all say, oh, later, later, later. And I kept saying, where's a Madagascar, Madagascar hissing cockroach? I wanna see a Madagascar hissing cockroach. Oh, later, later, later. So we were in the spiny forest and um, finally, um, our guide, you know, we kept telling our guide, where are the ten wrecks? You know, where's where's the Madagascar hissing cockroach? So he sent the little boy, the little guys off, and uh, it was actually the, the local guy's son and a friend of his. And they would come back with, with a hollow stick, and then they would shake the stick out. So lo and behold, here is the Madagascar hissing cockroach. This is his size. Namely, Darth Vader. Yes, and if you look at his head and a little bit of his thorax, he is definitely Darth Vader. So uh, I do believe that uh, they copied Darth Vader after the Madagascar hissing cockroach. And we did and we did say, well, can we hear it hiss? And so, you know, they, they shook him around or something and they, they do hiss. So a scorpion came out of one of the little logs. The spider was found somewhere. And, and here is a, uh, I forgot. Cockroach. No, no, this is a cockroach. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, I was saying, hold on, cricket. It's a green legged cricket. And then finally, Ken got his wish. So out of this log came this round ball, couldn't see anything, and then this nose sticks out of the round ball. Then this head comes out, and then the whole little belly comes out, and he's sucking his little foot. And then he finally turns himself around. So this is our only ten wreck that we saw, and this is the lesser hedgehog tenrec. So tenrecs are um, uh, endemic to, I uh, believe they're endemic to Madagascar. There are numerous species of tenrec. They're still making their own boats. These people are um, um, carving a boat out of a, a log, but doing some tremendous woodwork. Fine craftsmanship, uh, using wooden, wooden dowels, tapered dowels to fix the gunnel to the um, the whole, it was quite incredible to see them, all done with an axe. And they were very pleased that we came over and looked and, and they were very happy to show us uh, 
their, their craft. So um, it's an incredible place to visit. I highly encourage everyone if you have a chance to go. Um, the food is good. There's some French cuisine still around. The bread is good. And the accommodations are good. The birds are good. The mammals are good. The insects are good. Um, what else could you want? Um, there is some artwork. It's kind of, um, I, I find it beautiful. Um, tall and, and lanky and African whatever. Inspired. Yeah, yeah, African inspired. And not native, but these are just some uh, plants that are found around some of the lodges, but some pretty pictures. So thank you so very much. And I